All right, I'm back. Hey everybody, welcome to Director's Commentary. Um, these shows are a lot of fun for me, and the best part about them, I think, is it's, a, it's always a trip down memory lane. Uh, the show I'm gonna watch now with you guys, uh, I haven't seen in years. I bet you I haven't watched it in well over 10 years, maybe much longer. And even then, if I saw it at all, it's because I was in a bar somewhere and it was up on the TV screen, and maybe I saw a little bit of it with like subtitles, that sort of thing. So, uh, all right, well, uh, since I know you guys are watching this on SMTV Network, I know you've taken your time, you can sit down, you've got your laptop set up, maybe it's hooked up uh, by uh, HDMI to your TV, maybe you've got yourself a beer or a nice glass of wine. Cheers, everybody. Mm. Let's get this party started. Tonight's episode of Director's Commentary, brought to you by Survivor Man, also known as me, is uh, way back in time to season one, plane crash episode. This is a, I, I haven't seen this in so, so long. And if you recall, this is the episode where I did the whole broken arm fake thing. So I'm going to take a look at it, and we're going to go from here. I've already got, actually, I've got it pulled up right now on the, on the disclaimer. I said this before in the director's commentary. Sooner or later, along, uh, along the way, came the, uh, the lawyers and the insurance agencies, and you had to do these disclaimers. Mine says, the actions portrayed in the show are carried out by a professional. That's me. Who made me a professional survival guy? I have no idea. I don't remember getting any accreditation. But accreditation? Credits. How do you say that? Accreditation? Accredit accreditation? You guys know what I'm trying to say. I don't have any letters behind my name saying survival expert. Uh, and, but anyway, apparently I'm a professional according to this disclaimer. Do not attempt to duplicate, duplicate without expert supervision. Again, that'd be me. If you're going to do this, you better call me. I'll come and help you out. Uh, let's see. Some scenes contain graphic comment. Co some scenes contain graphic content. That'd be when I get naked. And viewer discretion is advised. It means watch discreetly. Here we go. Oh, man. Teaser. Has my energy ever drained? It's just hard to put one foot in front of the other right now and keep moving. And with one arm, survival is definitely, definitely extremely tough. But there still is one thing I can do with one arm. I can play with my... Yeah, yeah. No comment. If you haven't watched the other director's commentary, you missed the fact that this whole opening theme, I recorded, well at this point, I was still working out of my basement with my toddlers knocking on the door. I recorded this theme in my basement. The uh, bass, do -do 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 -do. that's me on bass guitar. And uh, I think I had some friends help me play a little bit on this too, I did. Here we go. It's the middle of winter, and I'm headed to the northern reaches of Ontario in a land called Tamagami. Now, no, Tamagami. Giant old growth forests, expansive beauty, Constantly changing weather, and in the wintertime, bridging the temperatures. So Tomogamy is actually where my cottage is. Uh, I've been going to Tomogamy for years. I first started going to Tomogamy. Tomogamy, Ontario, is a jewel of a place to go canoeing. If you've never, if you want to go and camp or you want to experience any canoeing, go to Tomogamy, Ontario. It's, if you're from Ontario, it's Algonquin Park without the people. Although I love Algonquin Park. But Tomogamy is spectacular. Spectacular. So that's why I did my very first canoe trip ever. And I was wearing constru Greb Kodiak construction boots with the steel toes, track pants, and a tank top. That's how I did my first canoe trip. And, but I was in heaven. And that's where I got bitten by the adventure bug and I just stayed with it all my life. So Tomogamy is where I first started. And so I knew when I was doing, although my original pilots were done way up in Wabakimi, when I was going to do the Survivor Man series, I think this is episode number two. Um, and I knew, well, let's go to Tomogamy. Now, the reality is Tomogamy is vast and beautiful and, and can be as remote as you want it to be. So even though my cottage now is up there, um, there's plenty of places to go and get remote, and that's what I did here. So that's why I chose Tomogamy. And uh, uh, this, is in, this is in the early days. You can hear over the years in my narration, I go from Tomogamy. You know, this is a land remote because, I'm, you know, it's that whole sort of machismo vo vo voiceover. But, and then over time I changed. So for like Bigfoot, I'm like talking to you like I'm whispering to you. And Survivor Man, beyond survival, it was a sort of a little more earnest uh, kind of tone. And I, so I, that, those, the way I speak in my narration is not 
so much contrived or calculated as I sculpt it to fit the story that I'm telling you. Let's, cut, let's watch. So this is one of my first times getting in a helicopter and doing this kind of stuff. It's not an extra, it's a way of life. Bush pilots are a tough breed. It's true. Bush pilots up there, like anywhere in the, in the north, are, let me turn it down. Survive a crash, and many pilots have lost their lives strapped into their seats. It seemed appropriate, actually, to, to show all of this, to show the, the, the helicopter taking the plane in for a couple of reasons. One is helicopter pilots, small plane pilots, anybody in the north, it's a tough, tough go. They have to know survival. Most of them know survival quite well. In the dead of winter. So here. You have to persevere because your very existence is being put to the test. So that coat, yeah, it's a little, there's going to be so much behind the scenes stuff with these early shows because I, I'm, you know, it's a long time ago. And, uh, and it's like memory for me. So there's a couple of things you can see me wearing there. That coat um, was uh, actually made by my mother. Um, I used to get 100% uh, wool blankets from the Goodwill or thrift stores and get them to my mother when she would c cut them into these, uh, what are they, like, almost like Hudson's Bay, like Voyager, like coats. And those mitts um, were uh, made, they're made uh, out of uh, moose hide. And I believe those ones were made for me uh, by a, a local native lady from Tomogamy. And the only alternative is death. The bush in winter offers no forgiveness. You either adapt quickly and survive, or you die quickly. That's a big point, actually. I'm always asked where the toughest place to survive is, and I've said this over and over again. It's not where, it's how cold is, is it. Because the cold, the winter, what I say is, if you have trouble, there's no forgiveness time. You gotta act quick. If it's 75 degrees and sunny, you've got forgiveness time if something goes wrong. And that's the biggest difference. It's not about where, it's about how cold is it. I have to spend the next seven days in this frigid north, alone. I have to admit over the years, using plain, helicopters, all sorts of manner of vehicles to get me out there was pretty darn exciting. In fact, the novelty of that has never worn off. I still love getting up in a helicopter. No matches. So I've laid out the stakes, always an important part of the show. That, intimidated by the frozen, isolated forest. That plane um, took me a while to find. I went to a plane wreck yard, and I'm not sure if I actually set, talk about it in the show. I think I probably do. It was a plane that was part of an accident that was a double fatality. There was still a little bit of blood on the seat. Kind of creepy. Establishing this plane for what I wanted to do, teach you survival in the wintertime, and establishing this scenario. That's easy for you to say. Gives me a lot to work from, because a lot can happen, and there's a lot to talk about as a survival instructor. Oh, and there goes my ride. Uh, this was part of some, some, always trying to inject realism into what I do, like, or at least establish and show you the realism what I'm doing. Uh, when I had those guys take and drop that plane off for me, I, I didn't give them any instructions. So this is actually my first time seeing the plane in this situation. So in other words, I didn't say, oh, put it over here because that's going to be a better place to have a shelter or do this with it. I just said, just go drop it in the bush somewhere and then drop me off. Depends on where you find yourself. In the desert, it's water. In an exposed area, it's shelter. Here, in the Canadian north, in the dead of winter. I've got one option and one option only right now get a fire going as soon as possible. Wow, look how young I am. I just gotta figure out how to There's do no that. There's no gray in my beard. Without any matches. This plane wreck is from an actual accident, a double fatality. So I do mention it. It's up to me to see how I can use it for survival. Maybe what I did mention is there's the still blood on the seat. back and pick everything up at the end of the week. So, yeah, and that's, you know, as you guys know in survival. <sighs> plane battery. Everything becomes double purposed. A crashed plane, but you're still mobile, that's a, a 
about two liters of dirty it's like a storehouse of possibilities and storehouse of supplies if you look at everything as a potential survival item or something you can use for survival start sweating too much I'm gonna put the fire on this side of the airplane the inside that green just gonna be coat windy. that I'm wearing um, again also that one right there my mother here. also made that I think that green one was my all-time favorite and in a moment of really stupid and foolish flirtation um, I was guiding some canoe trip and a girl asked if she could have it and I gave it to her and I've regretted it ever since because I've never had one that was as good as that green one found one birch tree and a cedar a couple of cedars and so I was able to find it even those pants I'm wearing that's this is real old school for me. Those pants are the, I believe it's the Swedish army wool pants or German army wool pants that I would, well, all of my initial survival clothing, everything that I did for adventure and training and learning and teaching survival uh, came from uh, army surplus stores and thrift stores. And people ask me like what they need now and the money they need to spend to get into things. It's, you don't need to spend a lot of money. You can, you can, and the fact is a lot of this old school clothing is way more rugged and tough for survival uh, experiences. You try to sleep by a fire wearing Gore-Tex. Good luck. A, you might go up in flames. B, you're going to have holes in it uh, and that are, are going to ruin it. Not so with old wool. Poof, come on. See, what I had to learn here was that you're never trying to spark hmm. the liquid gas, ever. And try this another way. Hoping this will kind of you're trying to spark the vapors we'll of gas. That's what ignites when you're putting well, a spark into gas. Rag ready. So I'm trying to well, spark it right onto the liquid, the not working. That ignites. It's the fumes. Ah. So I need to have a little pool so of I gas you. and an enclosure that will hold in the fumes ready for a spark. Yeah, you see, because otherwise the fumes are dissipating out into the air. So if I try to bring the gas into one place, close it in, the fumes will be in there and they'll be much more concentrated and they will take the spark and they'll spark and they'll ignite. I used my moose hide mitts as my shock insulation. Oh yeah. So you guys know that my, my happiness over getting fire going is always as real as you see it. Because I'm telling you, especially in a situation like this, fire is everything. I love it when a plan works out. I still have that hat. Don't have those pants anymore. All right. And I don't now have I that on. color beard anymore. I'll have to keep it going as much as possible. Oh, well, that's back in the um, days of goatee, my goatee. already going down. I mean, it's fading real quick. My only hope right now is to try to outfit that airplane in a way that I can survive the night in it. The only option I have for tonight is to hold up in the cockpit of the plane itself. Not exactly airtight. Not you, exactly warm. You'll notice that I was That's using got. Uh, a little mount on the bottom of the camera. And that, I think this is when I first got those little bean bag mounts. It's little called the pod. And I've been using them and even put a Survive Man logo on them over a time and, and work with the company for years. To this day, super useful. Well, this isn't going to be pretty. You know, as bad as it's going to be to sleep in that plane, it's always better than sleeping on the ground. Don't kid yourself. A survival shelter is rarely comfortable. I just need to block out the wind and keep in as much body heat as possible. That's the trickiest part in winter survival. Wind and having the body heat stay in with you. That's why you insulate the shelters. So, so for all of that, protection from the outside and keeping your heat with you. By the way, a little comment on that. I'll let this just take happen here. A little comment on that. You know, I, this is a, more of a camping tip than anything else. You always hear like the cool camping guy say, oh, dude, you know, if you want to stay warm at night, you've got to be naked in your sleeping bag. Night comes in pretty early this well, time of year. Well, I'll tell you. Thanks for a long night. <laughs> it's going to be a long night. The onset. Said that a lot. I'll tell you that is a most don't believe it. Reality. And I if you find a way to stay warm and comfortable and in survival in camping, challenge then that's what works for you. I have tried for years to sleep in my sleeping bags on a camping trip, regular camping trip, naked. And guess what happens? I freeze every single time. So I wear my long johns or my socks or uh, you know, uh, a top and, uh, and I'm warm. 
So you find out what works for you. But in a survival situation, you wear everything. I think the concept behind the naked and sleeping bag is your body heat heats up the bag and it stays with you. It, nah, I'm not buying it. It's never worked for me. Your heat still dissipates and now you're just colder. So, all you wives out there, when your husband's trying to tell you, honey, this is the way it's got to be, uh -uh. go ahead, wear your long johns. If you want to get amorous, save that for the sunshine in the middle of the day. eating snow for now. Everyone says, don't do it, don't eat snow. Well, I don't have any water, so I'm eating snow. And lastly, well, I do know where I am, and uh, you know that was I didn't actually point it out in this one. I think later in later episodes, probably Labrador, that I talk about eating snow. Certainly in Colorado, I did it, and um, so for now, over the years of learning survival, that was one of my little miniature pet peeves about the whole. You should never eat snow. Yes, you should. You know, as long as it's not cooling you down, then you're putting liquid in your body, and so especially in the middle of the day when you're nice and warm. I mean, it's no all day long. Strange looking clothing. When I knew I was going to be having to survive. Dehydration in the north in the of winter, will hurt you more yeah, in the warm. cold than um, it keeps about 80 of its some snow in your mouth. Value, even when it's soaking wet. But the best part is you can get real And if you really want to, you can just hold the snow in your mouth, melt it, and then swallow. Or, uh, or anything like that. It's not going to melt on you. So it's got to be wool. It's rugged. It's tough. Works for me. Oh, yeah. And back in the day, I'm talking about, you know, again, wearing this rugged clothing. The survival situation, so let's see, army surplus pants, wool sweaters that I would find, um, sometimes fur coats, you know, from the thrift store that I would rip apart and use that as insulation for something else. Well, nothing else matters. It's just you won't get me out in the middle of the Canadian wilderness in the middle of winter without a good axe and a wool blanket. And that's very true. In doing this, it's like, I'm not going to go out and grovel in the middle of winter time. That is death sentence. But an axe, okay, an axe is vital in the winter. So this is early in the, in the, in the era of shooting Survivor Man. And so it was about showing you exactly what I have. And that's it. I got the plane. I got those items. And this is when I also realized, why don't I start trying um, using items that Something I've never shown. I can kind of test out. That's what you'd have to do if you were actually injured. And in a plane crash situation, oh. if you did survive, and so that saw highly likely that you were was injured. part of that thinking. Here we go. This part. So it cracks me up. Let's do this with an injury this time. Just kidding. But let's simulate an injury. So let's assume that. My injury is a busted up left arm. So this was an idea that I had, and I've actually I've since done it again, which I was really happy to find. It now took a long time before I did it again. Did it in um, Romania with, uh, with the search and rescue episode and, and a broken leg. Obviously, I'm not going to actually injure myself for the sake of making Survivor Man. But I realized that if I can debilitate myself in such a way like this, it'll... Well, the, frankly, I'd never done that in my own survival training. So in doing it for you guys in Survivor Man, it was a way to see, okay, what would happen if I had a broken arm? What would it be like to try to do all of this with a broken arm? And that's what this was all about, um, was testing this reality and to see what Wrist is things might be like. It wasn't fun. I'm now officially injured. I am not looking forward to having the use of only one arm. But for now, this will give me a very small taste of the difficulties associated with an injury. At least I don't have to okay. deal with the pain. Well... That's very true. In reality, if I had an actual broken arm, now you've got all the pain to deal with as well. So there are things I just can't simulate as Survivor Man, but I'm trying my best, you know. And I've got to cover that up to make sure I can try and get this as windproof as possible. Right now, the clouds have come over. Which have You'll notice, too, I wasn't that silly. I left my good right arm out and injured my, quote-unquote, injured my left arm. And this door really is just in the way because it stops the heat from coming into me. Whereas I might be able to use it to block off some of these other holes. Think of it like when a boxer has his good arm tied behind, tied by his trainer, and can only work with his his off arm. It's the same kind of thing. You, you, in a survival here, I'm I'm now in this place where it's like, all right, I'm limiting myself now. Now what do I do? Well, you know, I'm how do I do this with one arm? Difficulties of surviving. With Very one challenging. Arm. Oh, this is in the days. This is before I hooked up with. Um, 
the Camillus Knife Company and started working and uh, making my own line of knives. I think that's probably a Leatherman. I used to like the, uh, the Leatherman um, wave a lot as my multi-tool, but now I have the Not Lestrade can multi-tool. Not of a plane Even only better. an axe and one arm. But all of this wiring gives me an idea. I can't remember what I do with the wiring. I think I make a, do I make a okay. snare? It's one guy ready to go. I do, okay. I make a snare. I see the loop. And uh, what I want to do is tie it off to uh, one solid. When I was training in survival I when I was right younger, really I, uh, so I, see there's some fresh I spent right years here. snaring. Um, specifically snowshoe hair. Kind of I was actually making, the uh, oh, there's the tracks. I was making a snowshoe hair blanket back in the day uh, of doing a lot of survival you training. You need 100 spot, pelts to do it. You got very good at snaring. And put the snare right in the middle, you stand a much better chance of catching one. This is the beautiful, the, uh, the, this is the beauty of, of snaring in the winter time. You've got tracks, real easy tracks to see. Uh, you know, you can, if you're, if, if you're good at tracking, you can spot them in the summer too. This is why I find the but winter the winter just makes it super easy. You want to learn how to track animals? Go out snare. in the winter time. You want to learn how to uh, uh, your, run a snare line or, or, or catch animals with a snare? Try it out in the winter. That's the, that's the easiest to start with. Okay. That should be pretty good. Uh, I just got to put my noose in place. Some animals are more difficult to snare than others because they can smell the human smell and they stay away. But rabbits. There we go. They ain't so clever. If I can get out of here without wrecking their own trail and creating too many footprints of my own, better off. Snaring can be a very effective hunting method, but it's a tough way to go. As the animal pushes hard with its legs to get away, it only serves to tighten the noose around its neck until it suffocates. All right, well, that's one snare. I've got to set up at least another five. Ten would be even better. I did know that my area of tomogamy, like that whole, I call it my area because, I, again, I did so much time up in that area. Although I'd never been to this spot ever and, and the plane just dropped the, uh, helicopter just dropped the plane off in some remote little lake. Um, I think residents of tomogamy, I think it was like, I think it, was, it might have been called Blueberry Lake. I could have that wrong. No cottages on it, just this little tiny lake off in the woods. Wood along the way, all um, the time. What I was saying though is that essential. lots of snowshoe hair in Tomogamy. Good lynx population, good cougar population, and good snowshoe this hair population. Is small enough to be manageable with the snowshoe hair feeding the lynx, obviously. Site. Working too hard can prove deadly as the combination of sweat and the frigid hey, cold. Oh, let me go, let me put that back just a second there. Oh. All right, there. Oh, okay. See that little thing hanging from my bum there? So that was a little homemade device I made years before this. I picked up an old pair of leather pants from a Goodwill, uh, an old wool blanket, and I cut out the bum down to just above the hamstrings. I attached the wool to the inside of this, used a piece of lampwick as, uh, as a belt through the loops, and I've, I wore that for a good 15 years. And what it did for me was it meant that wherever I went, uh, I could always just sit down in the, in the wet. That's all it was, just a bum to sit down. I lost that or, uh, years ago, and that's actually what I did do. I lost it. Oh, that's a sad day when I lost that because that thing was with me on many a survival expedition. I lost it, um, but it was brilliant. It was light wherever I hiked because I'd look around and people are always looking for a place to sit, putting down their little gl two gloves together to try to sit on the gloves and the moss. I could always sit wherever I wanted. Simple little thing, but it made time in the woods that much easier. Since then, I've actually gone out and, uh, oh, I just bought a little hunter's bum, I call it. And I do the same thing with it, but it still serves the same purpose. And I still watch everybody trying to find a place to sit, and I just sit down. Whew. Now you gotta think, I've gotta sit. See this other camera? All that well, stuff has to be set up. Now I'm doing it with one hand. Not fun. I wanted to set up the cameras and uh, Here we go. work on this survival saw to see how well it works. So I gave it a little, little practice pull just to see. And look, here's the one end, here's the other end. Busted right off one pull and it snapped right off. Here's the little ring that's supposed to go on. It's supposed to go on right there. Huh, useless. You know, 
it says that this is supposed to be good for a snare as well. That's a mighty small snare, if you ask me. Yeah. Stuff like that used to bother me a lot. That's why I was glad to put it on my show. The ice up here, this time because be three to survival five, items thick. are it's meant to be utilized shop. in times of extreme danger and usually horrifying situations. So all of these little tiny kits you can buy, ready-made kits, and I'm sure I'll say this again on new other director's commentaries as I show other items, you can't buy these cheap little kits. You know, when I put out my kits, um, uh, sorry, that's a shameful plug, but I have Survivor Man kits. Uh, they're expensive because they're the right gear. And there are things like, for example, I would often say, you know, on a survival kit, oh, I'm going to tangent here. On a survival kit, I would say, oh, well, let's put in a knife, you know, you always got a knife. No, because someone should own their own solid, real knife, not a gimmicky little knife you throw in a survival kit. Snare wire, well, yeah, real. Snare, those, those little saw things, how about a real one that actually works? Those little kits you get in those little bags, almost all of them, maybe, maybe all of them are a joke. And they, they're, now the thing is, the way I teach survival kits, it's this. It's like a first aid kit. You should never have to use a survival kit. They're not recreational. Is a first aid kit recreational? Yeah, I'm gonna recreationally cut myself so I can recreationally have some fun using some Band-Aids. Uh-uh. You want whatever's in your first aid kit to work for you in a time of injury, right? You want whatever's in your survival kit to work for you in a time of survival. That's the philosophy. So whatever's in your survival kit should be handpicked by you, if you don't get one of my kits, and you should know what it is, and it should work. You wouldn't throw joke Band-Aids in a first aid kit. You wouldn't throw in, you know, I don't know, um, what else to do with first aid? A sling that doesn't work in a first aid kit. Same thing for survival kits. So when I started doing Survivor Man like this, I thought, now's my chance to show people that there are things that are not going to aid you in survival. And in fact, in a way, make things more dangerous because you have a false sense of security thinking, well, I've got a survival kit. I just went to the sports store and bought this nice all-in-one kit. Oh yeah, it was $19, ready to go. Everything I need to survive. Nuh uh most of it's junk. I've pulled apart kits and found nothing in them redeeming and usable for survival. Would you do that with a first aid kit? Yeah, I don't think so. Ow, not that way. If I can bend this metal into shape, I may have a pot for boiling. But first, I want to burn off the paint. Yeah, I wasn't counting on that toxic paint on all this metal. And it just, it didn't really. I don't remember what I did. I don't know if I ended up, did I? I'm not sure, maybe I do boil water in it in the end. Can't remember. There, let me show you. But who wants to boil water in like toxic it. chemical that's gonna kill you anyway? And melt snow. Well, believe it or not, I feel fairly protected inside this little plane here. It's not very warm, but it's close to the fire and I am getting some residual heat in here. And I'd rather have a still cold night versus a slightly milder but very windy night. Long trek out across the lakes and the wind, and the chill will go right through snow -covered you. Bush. In these early days of Survivor Man, man, there was so much content, you know, first day alone, and you've got a quarter of the viewable episode already shot. And you got six days to go. This music is from my friend Peter Kleesh, who was my first uh, well, if the sun seems to musical the uh, companion to write the theme music, or not the theme music, because I, I wrote the theme, but the uh, background music. And get my cameras working and batteries warmed up. Keep this fire going. Got terribly cold last night. The wind stopped, the sky opened up, and that meant bitter cold temperatures. I don't want to stay here much longer. I'm going to make preparations to get out of here. I also lost time this morning going to check all my rabbit snares. Nothing. And not, <laughs> not a half a foot from the plane wreckage. There's fresh rabbit tracks, so one went right by me last night. That sun, that's a godsend in a survival situation, that's for sure. It buys me some, buys me some winter Once forgiveness again, time. Using the wreckage itself may help me to survive.
This was all experimental. I really didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't have a clue. And that's the, that's the good part of the, the realism and the reality of Survivor Man, is you see me trying to figure this all out. Or winter camping. Everybody's always looking for a place to sit down. Oh. Put their little gloves on. I do talk about my little bum there. Try not to get their bum wet. Well, I don't have to look for any place. I can just sit down wherever I want. Simple and silly, but it sure is effective. I think I'm just trying to make a toboggan. Took a lot of time to move, maneuver these. You know, there's a lot of stuff you're not seeing in terms of the camera work. A lot of maneuvering the cameras around. You know, the point is, I'm doing this thing. I'm doing this action. And I need to show you every element of that action so you, you get it. There is no way I can carry the battery with me on my way out. But there are yet other pieces of the plane that'll help me start a fire while I'm on the trail. Oh, this idea. All right, I teach you how to do charred cloth in the most rudimentary way here. And I did not know I was going to be able to do this. I figured what I was going to do was probably build a fire carrier. But uh, seeing all the cotton that was part of the plane and seeing the metal. the cotton into an enclosed space. Here we go. I can make charred cloth. Close it up like that. And I'm going to put it on the fire but not let the flames actually get to the cotton. And that way I make what's called charred cloth. And you'll see how that can help me out later, if it works. So charred cloth is a chicken before the, the egg the kind of scenario. Folded metal and left to blacken, but, not burn. but if you can get, using a fire, you can make your cotton become charred black. So calls for constant it will then Keep later the catch a spark really well and like hold it into an ember. Food. You use that with Tinder to you blow know, it into flame. Stuff, like filming a TV show. As a filmmaker, you know, a lot of things I did, absolutely, influenced by movies I watched, other documentary films. Bill Mason in Canada, as a filmmaker, was a heavy influence on me. Right down to the camera angles I used. But on the other hand, there was also a lot of adapting I had to do. Because I was the only person in the world filming a, a TV show by himself, oh, and that okay, called for new things, new inventions. Did you see the black stuff there? Yeah. Nicely charred. This is gonna work, I think. <laughs> okay, so this is charred cloth. Here we go. And all I have to do is try to get a spark to land right onto it, and it should catch a glow, and with any luck, fire will follow. Instead of being burnt to ash, the cloth is charred and turns into what is essentially very thin charcoal, ready to take a spark. I guess that's the right way to describe charred cloth. Very thin charcoal. Oh, I remember trying to get through here with the one arm. My idea of getting through this ice I'm sure I was injured for the next few months based on this. I can't keep this up. The risk of damaging my one good arm is too great, especially knowing that my challenge is to head out of here soon. That's an interesting problem Sleeping with an injury. Winter nights is at best you know that if you injure one there, side of you, one arm, one leg, crazy. one foot, so in the noonday sun, I catch you then start to favor the other. And in favoring the other, you potentially create a whole new injury on that side as well. But the sun may not last long. Oh man, has my energy ever drained? It's just hard to put one foot in front of the other right now and keep moving. But that's what you gotta do. You gotta have that firewood, gotta keep the fire going. And with one arm, survival is definitely, definitely extremely tough. But there still is one thing I can do with one arm. I can play with my harmonica. To Les Stroud, from the students of Sawmill Valley Public School. And this is back in the early days of Survivor Man, when I was, you, you could email me, direct me, directly. It's even hard to play harmonica with one hand. It 
Sounds like the key of C. Three days without food. I think I'll call it a night. The weather today was perfect for travel. Tomorrow, I'll try to take a stab at leaving. That way I won't be late, which would worry the rescue crew. It's too cold. Too cold. It was cold. That's the thing that gets you. Survival is that moment right there. It's not two in the afternoon. Survival is three o'clock in the morning. It all comes down at three o'clock in the morning. Other plans for me. And in comes the weather. Now, of course you realize that I've got to get out in the morning, set up the camera, turn it on for a while, go back into my little shelter. Sometimes I actually fall back to sleep a little bit, and then I come out. And I hope the camera's still rolling. Making this protected little shelter into an exposed shelter. Wind is always tough. Oh, you see that little that little label on my coat there? That little circular is a little patch I got from the very first survival course I ever took for completing the course. That's all that coat is. Real quick. I may not be getting anywhere. Not today. Weather will shut you down and close off your plans every single time. Plane wreck. Another night. Got a snare up in here. I'll check. <laughs> check it out. This was a pretty amazing feeling. I had set this snare up only 12 hours before using the wires from the plane. Sometimes you get lucky. In terms of this is this is a, a big moment both in terms of filmmaking and in survival. In in the in the survival side of it, that well, should be obvious. I now have a full rabbit to eat, and that's huge. You can see he wasn't, uh, he's not that long dead either. No, don't really know what to say. I, uh, you know, I hate to take the life of any animal. And the reason why I say this? Survival, then, uh, if it's a case of live or death, life or death, all creatures are fair game. Dinner. Now, why did I bother to say that? I've taken some flack on that. Dude, don't be such a pussy. Why are you talking about, like, you, you know, not, what are you, because you killed, no, you don't like to kill an ant. Come on. I'm making Survivor Man, a TV show. Not, I, I, you know, I could, I could pull the plug on this and not do this. So I'm just pointing out the fact that, listen, it's not about being afraid to take the life so that I can survive, so that I can eat. It's about respecting all living things. And even in survival, hunting, fishing, it's about respecting and connecting to the animals that I take that I'm going to eat. That's why I made that comment. So, under, so people understand this is about respect. This is a respectful situation. I'm taking the life of another animal so that I can eat. Now, did I need that food? Darn right, I really needed that food because I was out there surviving. But on the other hand, I am making a TV show. That's what put me out there to survive. So I needed to just establish that there's a respectful uh, relationship going on here between myself and the natural world. So what I was saying about, there's two, there was two things about the, the, the rabbit. The survival, very big moment, food, but also the filmmaking. This is when I go, I know I've got an epic moment of survival for this episode of Survivor Man, and I can kind of hinge everything around this moment right here. I hinge everything creatively around this moment. Now I get to teach how to get the fur off of a rabbit, how to cook it. Just opens up a whole new avenue of instruction by being fortunate. It's like catching fish. Okay, now that I've caught the fish, I can teach everything about the fact that I've caught the fish. If nothing happens, yeah, it's just a lot of watching me starve. If you can capture game this big, there are many more uses for them other than food. Oh, oh that's cool. I think this was episode okay. two of Survivor Man. I'm pretty well, sure. I said, 
to take it off like a sock. Is Maybe three. Can't remember. Fur on the inside. You now have essentially a sock. Well, I'm going to save you the grossness of uh, taking the guts out and uh, get this guy cooking. Although I did film it. There's no need. I've never found it the need to be sensational about the stuff that I eat on, on Survivor Man. Sometimes eating a scorpion or a snake or what have you, it's kind of sensationalistic enough. I don't need to well, invent drama around it and make sure blood is smeared on my face. How about I just respect the animal and eat it? I can do but sit here and... and let's face it, in the wintertime in northern Ontario, and, uh, nobody's being a vegan. Out of the rain in a little shelter here. After four days without food, it's easy to get over the sadness of killing an animal and attend to the most basic of human needs, the need for food. This is where my filmmaking and my actual survival meet. That's what I was saying, see? The moment of catching something like a rabbit means I've just hit two epic moments, one for survival and one for filmmaking. It's graphic, it really shows what's going on, it opens up things I can teach. So I didn't need to uh, play off it and make it bigger than it was. I completely abandoned the whole one -arm survival Think about it, look where I am. I'm in the middle of the bush there. There's nothing around me for miles and miles and miles and I've got no food with me. It is dramatic. This reminds me of the Jeremiah Johnson moment. What's on the spit? Grow in particular. Now, this is gonna taste good. Wow. Mm. Rabbit is a good survival food in the fact that they're not hard to catch. However, there is a thing called rabbit starvation. See, they're completely lean, no fat. And if you eat nothing but rabbits, so you catch a couple of dozen and exist over the next month or so, you <coughs> eat nothing but rabbits, you bring yourself into protein poisoning. You've got to get fat somehow. But that's because most people don't continue to eat the internal organs and the brain and the eyes and even the bones. And you can bet I'm going to finish off every little bit of this rabbit tonight. And that's that's big part of the difference of protein poisoning is you, you, you've got to take in all of the, you know, the internal organs, liver, things like that to offset that. That was a big moment. I remember that. You know, part of the storm well, holding me down. It was freezing rain or snow all night long. Fire's pretty much <laughs> It's kind of like, out. I knew leaving this location it. is not going to be fun. Make my way out of here. In a way, it was kind of, it stalled me from Five doing the inevitable, which is leaving, which is going to be rough. I can use what I broke kinda, it was kind of okay to stay out. put for a bit. And the rescue crew will come in later to clean up the mess. I lost a full day due which, to the bad weather. It would have been nice to get another snowshoe hair or two. Yeah, it would have been, which is true. Um, after this all happened, they flew back in and they picked all this stuff up and they, we, cle we cleaned out the area. More on that later. There's one or two locations where they didn't go back and clean up and I've taken some flack for that. Um, I'd love to say it's not my fault. Um, of course, everything's my fault because I run the show, but some people did not follow through on their commitments, that's what I'll say. In this case, they definitely went back and cleaned up. And off I go. So even shooting this, yes, that's right, I gotta walk way over to this side of the lake, set up the camera, and then walk across the frame. The whole point of that is to show you what I'm going through. It's filmmaking. Weather turned pretty nasty here late in the day. I'd love to be able to build a nice rock shelter with covering and everything, but you know what? I'm on the move, and uh, I think rather than put the energy into building a big shelter, I'm going to put the energy into gathering a big whack of firewood. And if I have to, I'll just sit beside the fire all night. Yeah, and see, that was, you know, that's... Recently I was talking to somebody about where would you survive and where would you stay in a... In, in a which location? And in the winter, we were on a hike, and this is what I like to point out, you know, for me in the winter, I've got a pace going if I see warm, the risk of where I can get a massive fire going, I'll take that over a shelter any day. I think I just made the comment about my pacing. 
slow and even, no sweating, because you sweat. It's pretty hard to get a fire going right on the snow. You die. Sucks the moisture right up. Got big wood. Got the base. Got my little spot. Tinder. It's a risky decision to make, but I think the effort of trying to build a solid shelter would be better put into maintaining a big fire. There's a lot of easy wood nearby. Perhaps a little unorthodox for the survival manuals, but I know it can work. See, that's the thing. That was the other the thing I used to like to do was, you know, oh take on my pet peeves with survival manuals and things they say you should or could do. And sure, it's always about building a shelter in the winter, but what if you can have a massive fire? You can put up with almost anything sitting beside a massive fire. And I, I looked around. There was lots of standing dead firewood. So, spend my time building a cold coffin or get a massive fire going. Which would you do? It made a spark off the axe. So I'm just holding the axe just right above it. Let's see if I can. Now, I know my axe has an element of carbon. Come on. In the, a high element of carbon in the in the um, in the steel, which is on purpose, it's because I know oh. it'll spark. Come on. But it's finding the right rocks to make that spark. This was hard. You can see the spark there. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Okay. I don't want to mess around too much, but I will show you. There's the charred cloth. See that? It's like a little piece of thin charcoal. Right. Put it in my cedar. Now... I'm doing something that I've done many, many times. You know, sometimes I try things uh, that I've never tried before, like the broken arm was an experiment. Oh, that's beautiful. But I've blown many a fire to flame this way. So it's yes, bringing indeed. back the familiar, familiarity of, of knowing what I need to do in terms of fire, but inventing and uh, ad-libbing with the fact that the, the, the axe makes a spark if I find the right rock. I forgot, I must have been talking over my own narration, but along the way, the broken arm thing, it was just incredibly ridiculous to carry on. And I, I, just, I knew I had things, other things I wanted to show you about survival, and so I, I dropped that whole sort of uh, concept. And here I am. Look at the size of that fire. Now, if you've ever sat beside a big fire, fire, you know you can't even get, get close to it sometimes if it's too big. Well, in the wintertime, that's a good thing. You just find that sweet spot between not getting too hot and not being too far away from the flames. All right. Have a look at what I'm trying to follow. It's really faint in this overcast. You can just barely see old snowmobile tracks. Now, this was all, again... This was, I knew I needed to walk in a general direction to kind of walk away and out of this, get back to civilization. But I really still didn't know exactly where I was going. But when you see something like, this is, what do I call this? You call this, if I'm talking to, to my, my editor, we call it actuality. The stuff that happens to me while, during the making of Survivor Man that I did not count on. If I'm in the desert and I think I'm going to try the hand drill, I know I'm going to get to that and try that. Finding snowmobile tracks when I'm trying to find my way out, I can't plan. So it becomes real elements of a survival situation that I get to teach you. Wow, there's so much missing time here in terms of being by that fire well, and leaving the fire. The snowmobile trail. That's no guarantee of rescue. Up here, you could walk for more than a week on established trails and never see a soul. That's very true. It's much like finding a road. I am very very lucky or human trail few days back. or train tracks it means I can get by those things do not guarantee you're walking in the right direction on them or that anybody's going to come along on them soon of this trail and I'm thigh deep in snow now is a problem you know on the lake things are packed down pretty good but once you start going up into the bush on a winter trail the snow just gets deeper your efforts get much uh, more strenuous
I'm not even sure what I'm doing here. Huh. Oh yeah. All of this was to show you was to get that shot. But it's almost impossible for the Because I thought it was cool as heck to get that shot of me traveling this trail. And then it was just like a lot of work for just around the next two seconds. It's a dangerous mantra. And now I've broken one of my own cardinal rules. I've warmed up, but I let myself get wet with sweat. Stopping now without a ready-made shelter or fire, and I could easily freeze. Sticking to the trails means I shouldn't get lost, even in the dark. This was... I remember this now, yeah. This was a dangerous... Uh, it was like the nor walking down the hill in Norway. I put myself in a dangerous situation. In the frigid night air of a northern Ontario winter. I remember this decision. Well, I made a decision. See, it's sixth night. Tomorrow's the seventh day. I'm supposed to be making my way out of here tomorrow. And let's not forget, I do know exactly where I am, where I've got to get to, right. to get home. So I figured rather than sleep, 15, inter 15 minute intervals. Oh, my mouth's frozen. Yeah, All night long. It's cold. Oops. I just keep walking. See, I can't get lost if I follow these snowmobile trails. I should be good to go. As long as I don't hit a lake. Ah, I can sleep tomorrow in the sun. I and mean, I'm awake anyway. So let me repeat, I can't get lost as yep. long as I stick to the trails and don't come to any lakes. So as dark as it looks there, so, it's light enough to my, my eyes, maybe not the camera, to my eyes that I, I can see and I'm walking through the bush on a trail. So I won't get lost on this trail. And that was a choice to make, a very interesting survival choice to make. You know, when you decide to keep pushing on it can be a very dangerous choice to make and a big mistake. And for me, uh, okay, these trails will well, take I'm me out of here. As exhaustion sinks into my so just walk all night. It's all about the constant push and forward. if I pace how myself, I mean, how, how many of you guys have stayed up all night partying? Places. It's basically that, right? So I'm just like, all right, I'm going to stay up all night and keep walking. I'll walk myself out of here since I gotta be finished by tomorrow anyway. That, or build a whole new shelter, try to sleep, or build a whole new fire, try to sleep. And knowing they were gonna be looking for me, the option was, you know what? Just keep walking. Sometimes, I think my production team is waiting for the chance to film my failure to survive. Perhaps hoping that they will be there to catch Survivor Man face down in the snow. Maybe the commentary on my survival team was a bit exaggerated. I don't really have a team. I just basically had somebody who might have to come and pick me up back then. There wasn't a lot of budget behind this first season, so. Since I'm still a few miles from civilization, they get their chance at a small rescue. I can't even remember who filmed this. I think I, I had a young kid from Tomogamy hop up in the helicopter and, 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 and film this. Now I'm just having fun. I think I could have made it back before night falls again, but I'll take the lift back and get it. This angel. is one frostbitten Canadian boy, happy to go home. There you go. And for any of you who are actually Canadian, that line, frostbitten Canadian boy, yeah, I stole that from Kim Mitchell from a rock band we have up here called Mac Lee. It's called Max Webster, and then Kim Mitchell had a solo. Anyway, he's got a, there's a line in one of his songs about something about, I'm just a frostbitten Canadian boy trying to, trying to, Oh, what's the line? Oh, all you Canadian guys are, know what this is. It's maybe you can tweet this in or or or, or, or put it in the commentary. Let's see, I'm a frostbitten Canadian. Oh, I know what it is. Sorry, I'll beat you to it. Oh no, let's do the contest. I know what the next line is. Uh, I think it's me. I'm just a frostbitten Canadian boy. And the next line is trying to blank. What does he say? What's he trying to do? I know the line. I got it now. All right, uh, on that note, 
Uh, thanks once again for joining me for Director's Commentary. I'm going to keep these coming. I'm having fun doing these. It's a walk down memory lane for me. It's a chance for me to show you some behind the scenes and fill you in on stories that you've not heard before and how I've made this series over the last 16 years. Um, and uh, thank you once again for being part of smtvnetwork.com. I'm not stopping. You guys stay with me. I will keep pre uh, uh, presenting more content every single month, even weekly, constantly producing new material and, and, and crafting the archival material that you've never had a chance to see. So that is season one, Plane Crash, Director's Commentary. Special thank you to my two camera guys who are hanging out, standing, sitting still, doing absolutely nothing, Chris and Luke. And uh, I don't know what else to say. I got to go replenish my wine. See everybody. Onwards. <laughs>